You know, our theme this afternoon is reimagining America. And you really have to start when you start talking about America with the idea of capitalism. Because this is the home, the epicenter of global capitalism. It was Calvin Coolidge who said in 1925, the chief business of the American people is business. And there's absolutely nothing to be embarrassed about in that statement. Business is a wonderful institution. It may be the greatest idea we human beings have ever had in many ways, as I will try to establish. And we can actually go beyond the way that we have thought about it and practiced it the last couple of hundred years and evolve towards this idea of conscious capitalism, elevating our, the consciousness with which we practice business. The Tata. Welcome to Chai with Manju. Our special guest today is quite a trailblazer. He's the founder and leader of rapidly growing conscious capitalism movement let us meet Raj Sisodia. Hi Raj, Hi, nice Manju. to meet you. Nice to meet you. So uh, your name has become quite synonymous with conscious capitalism, but your journey didn't quite start out that way, right? So you were born in Ratlam, but I read that you lived in four countries, six cities, eight different schools, six of them were convents. So what was that like? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, looking back, it's quite fascinating. I was in India, literally I grew up in a village uh, near Indore until the age of five. Oh, okay. Uh, and uh, meanwhile, my father had left for Canada when I was about two and a half. He went to do his PhD. Mm -hmm. And in those days, you didn't go back and forth. So he went and he didn't come back for four and a half years. Oh, wow. Uh, my mother was pregnant with my sister when he left. And when he came back, mm -hmm. my sister was three and a half years old. And she had never seen him. We used to right? see that in Hindi movies a lot, yeah, right? This was, uh, like, and even I had forgotten him. So from the age of five to seven, then I was in school in Atlam with my uncles. Mm -hmm. And then when my father came back, having got his PhD in cytogenetics, which is plant wow. breeding in Canada. Uh, he got a job in Barbados, in the okay. West Indies, with the British West Indies Sugar Corporation mm -hmm. to do sugarcane research. So then uh, a few months after he came back, we moved to Barbados. And I went from mm -hmm. St. Joseph's Convent in Atlam to Holy Family and then some other school in Barbados, you know. Uh -huh. And uh, it was quite a change. Moving Colorful too. Time. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's, uh, you know, life suddenly became quite different. And we were there for two years and then my father got a job in California in uh, okay. Salinas which is the hometown of John Steinbeck. Uh -huh. And so, um, subsequently you did um, electrical engineering in Bitspilani, right? And yeah, so we moved back to India after another year in Canada, then we moved to Jamalpur and then Indore I finished my high school and then uh -huh. You know, in those days, India was a dead economy. I mean, True. Really, nothing was happening. 1974, when I graduated mm -hmm. high school, mm -hmm. um, the marginal income tax rate was 97%. Right. Right. Just imagine that. The highest mm -hmm. rate of income tax was 97%. Mm -hmm. The economy was not growing. There was shortages of everything. You know, you had to wait years to buy a car, mm -hmm. seven years right. to buy a scooter, you know, the black Telephone. Market. <laughs> Telephone, 14 years, because right. that came <clears throat> from the government. Right. Um, there was a black market and everything, you know. So there were very few opportunities. So if you were good in math and science, mm -hmm. you kind of went to engineering. And if you were good in biology and science, you went to medicine. Right. Right. <laughs> like, <laughs> yes, like me. And if you weren't in either, then God help you, right? I mean, maybe you get a Bachelor of Arts and maybe you get into the IAS. So that's only 100 people in the whole country got mm -hmm. into that, right? And so, no, you know, we didn't have the luxury of thinking about what is my passion and what is my purpose. It's really like, what's going to get me a job? Right, and so you know, being pretty good in math and science, it was engineering. Uh -huh. And I got into Bits Pilani, which was a very good, very good school. Uh -huh. So I went off to Pilani and became an electrical engineer, even uh -huh. though I really had no passion for that. You know, uh -huh. it was just the thing to do, the uh -huh. pragmatic choice. You know, if I, somebody uh, had asked me, I would have really. I did enjoy writing. Yes. I was a voracious reader, and so being a journalist, that held a certain kind of romantic appeal for me. You know, yes. I thought journalists were, you know. Sometimes kind of it happens heroes. when the timing is right. <laughs> yeah, so I had that. In fact, even in Pilani, I was the editor of some of our, you know, the okay. magazine. You know, the it was called Sinusoidal Times of all things, which is a <laughs> sine wave. Uh, so I did a little bit of writing even there. Okay. But uh, but I did finish my engineering and then got a job as an engineer. Mm -hmm. Very briefly, I worked for 29 days as an engineer. Uh huh. Last night, to go in one day. Okay. And then I found out that if you got an MBA. Uh -huh. You know, your salary would double and uh, you could work in an air-conditioned office. You said from 100 to 200 dollars. Roughly, right? yeah. It was, uh, you know, I was getting 800 mm -hmm. rupees a month mm -hmm. and uh, the MBA starting salary was roughly 1500. 
Right. But I was working in this electrical switchgear factory in uh, Bawai. Hot, hot, in hot. Bombay, you know. I was like, oh my God, I can't deal with this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so after 29 days of that, as soon as I got admission to Bajaj Institute of Management, yeah. okay. I, I happily typed out my resignation letter and went off to business school. And then there is a very interesting story about how you came to United States and yeah. <laughs> uh, going for GMAT, right? <laughs> yeah, so you know, I always, having spent time here as a child, I felt this was kind of a home for me. I mean, I, formative years especially. Right? And coming back here was a dream for a lot of people. Right. Coming to the U.S. was mm -hmm. a dream. And for me, it was like coming back. Right. But I didn't know how, mm -hmm. you know, because uh, I was doing my MBA. And, you know, I didn't know that you could do a Ph.D. in business. Mm -hmm. So one day I come down for breakfast in our graduate hostel there in Bombay. And 10 of my friends were dressed up and going somewhere when we didn't have any classes that day. I said, where are you going? They said, we're going to the U.S. Information Agency to get the GMAT applications. Mm -hmm. I said, why do you need the GMAT? We're already doing our MBA. Uh -huh. I said, no, we're going to apply for a Ph.D. in business. Mm -hmm. I said, I didn't know you can do a Ph.D. in business. Uh -huh. I said, give me five minutes, I'll come with you. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. And so the irony is that out of that group of 10 or 11 of us, I'm the only one yes. who ended up coming here. So your destiny was bringing you here. Right? Yeah, and it was just a means to an end in a way. I got a full scholarship to Columbia. And I did marketing because I didn't like finance. Uh -huh. So again, there was no there was no positive energy driving it. It was just you know I know I didn't want engineering, then I didn't want finance. So I ended up a marketing professor. Okay. And that I was got, in BU. So then I started here in BU. Yeah, first job. 1985. 85. Yeah. Okay. And you know I soon discovered there are of course aspects of marketing that are very interesting and, uh, and and even fun, but you know in practice the way it's done, I just started to have a lot of misgivings about it. Okay. You know, we spend enormous amounts of money on marketing in this right. country. A trillion dollars a year. So a few years ago, we did an estimate mm -hmm. in 2007, you know, which was equal to the GDP of India. What we were spending on ads and coupons in this country mm -hmm. in 2007 was the GDP of India. So a billion plus people were living on what we were spending on ads and coupons. And my question was, what are we getting for all that? Okay. And I found that when we did a study on the image of marketing, 88% of people have a negative view of marketing. Mm -hmm. uh, so I said, customers, companies, and society are not really benefiting. Companies mm -hmm. get a very low return on that investment. Society, in many ways, is also hurt. You know, marketing creates an impact on the popular culture. Right. It has an impact on the right. way we think about life. Right. It has an impact on young women, especially. There's been a lot right. of research showing, mm -hmm. you know, eating disorders, depression, body dysmorphic disorders, Absolutely. because of the way women are objectified, yeah. uh, for example, in advertising. So I had all these concerns and misgivings about marketing. I didn't find that it was an inherently noble profession. Then I did a book called Does Marketing Need Reform? Mm -hmm. Basically asking the question, do we fundamentally need to rethink this whole thing? Because we spend all this money, everybody is doing more with less. In marketing, we're spending more and more and we're doing less and less. In terms of customer satisfaction, loyalty are going down, okay. even as spending is going up. And then what, what I found interesting is that you knew the problems, but then you mentioned somewhere that talking to your mentor, Jagdish, said he told you that in this country, people want only solutions, yes. not problems, <laughs> right? And I had spent 10 <laughs> years, you know, really making the case how bad right. things were, right. you know, and sort of admiring the problem, uh -huh. uh, you know, from every angle. And talking a little bit about what we can do about it. For the so, most part, however, the focus was on that. Uh -huh. So I actually started a book called The Shame of Marketing. Yes, I, I read know, the phrase used by Peter Drucker, who's a well-known management thinker, is that the consumer movement in America is a shame of marketing. Mm -hmm. if, if, if marketers are doing their job, they should mm -hmm. be looking after the well-being of customers. Why should they have to organize against companies? Yeah. You know? So I was going to do a whole book, expanding on my 10 years of work, and making the case how bad it is, and that's when Jack gave me that advice. He said, people here want to hear about the solution, not the problem. We have spent a lot of time on the problem. Do we have a solution to offer? Right. And that simple insight just turned everything around. Because I just flipped that project, I called it In Search of Marketing Excellence right. as a working title. And I said, you know, we've been contending that companies spend too much right. and then have very low customer loyalty and trust, nothing mm -hmm. to show for it. Well, what's the opposite of that? The ideal would be you don't spend a lot and yet you have very high loyalty and trust. Because right. that's the ultimate holy grail for marketing is to mm -hmm. have loyal and trusting customers. Mm -hmm. right. So I said, let's look for that in search of marketing excellence. Mm -hmm. So we started to find companies that actually spend a lot less than their peers and yet had much higher loyalty and trust. Mm -hmm. And as we found those companies, we started to look for patterns as to what they were doing. And in 2007, I think your destiny changed in some ways yes. when you wrote the book, uh, Forms of Endearment, right? right. And right. Uh, then uh, after the release of the book, you said you met uh, John 
McKay, McKay, McKay yes. co-founder yes. of Whole Foods. So tell us what that, what was that like? Right. So that uh, in search of marketing excellence actually became firms of endearment. Mm -hmm. That was the book that got published out of that research. Okay. Because we found after a while that these were companies that it wasn't about the marketing, it was about all stakeholders. Mm -hmm. We found that they had a reason for being. Mm -hmm. You know, they weren't just, they weren't a business with a mission, they were a mission with a business. Whole Foods is trying to change the way we eat. Absolutely. Southwest was trying to change the way you know, the airline industry works. Mm -hmm. You know, CarMax was trying to change the way used cars are sold. Jordan's Furniture here was trying to change yes. the way you know, the furniture, etc. So they had a passion. Google was trying to you know, change the whole world of information. Uh, container stores trying to organize your life so that you can right. have a more, more peace of mind. You know. So uh, it had those elements, purpose, stakeholders, leaders mm -hmm. were very much driven mm -hmm. by people and purpose and the culture were built mm -hmm. on trust and caring. Mm -hmm. So the book was called Firms of Endearment, which I felt was a bit of a hokey title <laughs> at the time, you know, but based on that, in your mind. It's that <laughs> movie, Terms of, Terms of Endearment, right? Right? which makes you cry every time. <laughs> but I really felt, you know, these were companies mm -hmm. built on love and care. Mm -hmm. and this was a huge difference. I had never heard the word love mentioned in the context of business or work mm -hmm. in general. Mm -hmm. and, and yet here were these companies that were not only built on that, they were far more successful. If you had asked any business leader at the time, if a company were to operate according to these kinds of principles, they would say, oh, the market would eat them alive. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there. Only the paranoid can survive. Mm -hmm. You know, business not personal, it's business. Mm -hmm. You can't be that way and succeed in business. Mm -hmm. Well, as it turned out, these companies are far more successful. Absolutely. They made nine times as much returns in the stock market, right, over a 10-year period compared to mm -hmm. the average company. So this was not only an acceptable way of being, this was actually a far superior from a performance standpoint, and they were also creating all these other positive impacts mm -hmm. on people's lives. So then when I met John Mackey, because Whole Foods was one of the companies we mm -hmm. featured quite prominently, and he and I, you know, we spent a day together, mm -hmm. and then we had ended with dinner mm -hmm. in Austin, Mm -hmm. And I showed him a mind map that I had created, mm -hmm. a vision, because I was so excited. You know, this was the only time I had an experience writing a book where I had tears in my eyes. Mm -hmm. okay. Literally, we had tears in our eyes when we were on a writing mm -hmm. retreat in the Poconos and in New Hampshire. Because there were heartwarming stories about what these companies were doing for people. Mm -hmm. right? And I felt something awaken in me. Because mm -hmm. until then, my work had just been a job and a career. Mm -hmm. And now I felt that this could be a calling. That this is something that I would want to devote the rest of my life to. Mm -hmm. That here is a message that resonates with me at a deep level because mm -hmm. I was a very idealistic kid. Mm -hmm. Sometimes your purpose finds you. Yes. You know, because Absolutely. I had those qualities and that, that, that work somehow came to me and then so I had a vision for what I was calling the Institute for New Capitalism. Mm -hmm. You know, I like acronyms, so the acronym mm -hmm. was INC, I N C, uh -huh. right? Mm -hmm. And I had that mind map which was kind of a vision document. Uh -huh. So I showed it to John and he said, you know, he looked at it, he said, you know, that's exactly my vision. This is what I want to do with the rest of my life. But I call it conscious capitalism. Mm -hmm. And I had never heard the phrase before, and I said, that's uh -huh. interesting, conscious capitalism. And then you founded mm -hmm. the uh, non-profit organization. Right, so then, uh, yeah, so a few months later, then we had a retreat at his ranch. Uh -huh. We invited about a dozen people, and we said, let's try to start a movement mm -hmm. to create this whole, um, uh, you know, to, to um, uh, flesh out this philosophy of conscious capital, which was basically mm -hmm. what was in terms of endearment. Mm -hmm and to create awareness for it and then create a movement and change people's minds because business is the greatest change agent in the world Absolutely. if we do it right. Absolutely. It can also cause enormous harm if we don't do it right. right. You know? And so changing that is the biggest leverage we have and that's what our effort has been since 2008. And now you have uh, 25 chapters and you're in 10 different countries, right? Yeah, I think we're close to 30 chapters in the U.S. now okay. and about okay. 10 other countries. Mm -hmm. uh, we have major conferences every year. There's a Conscious Company magazine. Okay. Uh, there's a fair amount of awareness now about this idea in the world. I teach a course on this. You know, Babson, right? At Babson, yes. Okay. And we've written a book called Conscious Capitalism and subsequently other books that zero in more on the leadership and other aspects. And we're seeing in the real world also so many companies like the recent market basket phenomena here, then even Chobani yogurt. We, we see yeah. the way the business is, cha is done changing now. Yes. Right. It is changing, so mm -hmm. certainly there's a rising consciousness. Right. And one of the things that I recently um, was reading, and of course we saw this big women's action movement in Boston recently, which pertains to your new book also, Shakti uh, Leadership. So yes. tell us a little bit more about that as well for the US. Well, I think, you know, one of the biggest stories, we're living in a time of momentous mm -hmm. change. There are a lot right. of things that have changed mm -hmm. in the last quarter century. I mean, I talk mm -hmm. about the year 1989, for example, mm -hmm. as a real turning point in human history. Mm -hmm. 
not only was it the collapse of the Berlin Wall and Tiananmen Square, so the end of that debate between communism right. and capitalism in a way, mm -hmm. the Exxon Valdez oil spill, so environmental consciousness, the Salman Rushdie fatwa, so religious right. fundamentalism. Mm -hmm. uh, but beyond that also, you know, there were demographic changes that happened, uh, the, uh, aging of the population, more people above the age of 40 that year. The World Wide Web was invented that year. And that year also was the first year where we had more women college graduates cumulatively mm -hmm. than men in this in this country. Mm -hmm. And now, of course, it's way skewed in favor of women because women are 58 to 60 percent of college students. And so one of the big trends that's going on in the world mm -hmm. is the rise of feminine mm -hmm. values. Okay. So it's the rise of women on the one hand. Numerically, mm -hmm. there are many, many more women with college degrees mm -hmm. now. So white collar professions of mm -hmm. all kinds will mm -hmm. be dominated by women right. in years right. to come. Because women, not only are there more of them, they get higher grades and they graduate at a higher rate. Right. Right? So, and this is, by the way, not just U.S. Oh, absolutely. All in in India as well, we see medical schools everywhere. Yeah, it's, in, it's, it turns out that the only places in the world where men still outnumber women are in South Asia and India mm -hmm. and Sub-Saharan Africa. Mm -hmm. Everywhere else, women outnumber men in college. So there's just the numerical reality of more women rising through the system in a world where you do need now higher education mm -hmm. for most things. But beyond that, it's also the awakening of the so-called feminine values. So even women in the old days who were rising to positions of power were actually rising more as men, mm -hmm. if you think about it. Absolutely. So Indira Gandhi was called yes. the only man in her cabinet. Right. Right? And Margaret Thatcher was the Iron Lady. The Iron Lady. And Golda Meir was the original <laughs> Iron Lady. So the only way women could actually make it in a man's world was to be so tougher and more aggressive and more ruthless than the men. Mm -hmm. Today, what we're finding is when we have more women coming up, they're actually able to be who they are, mm -hmm. right? And that's coming from a more holistic place mm -hmm. where nurturing, caring, compassion, empathy, mm -hmm. vulnerability, those are also part of, you know, alongside being strong and disciplined and courageous mm -hmm. and resilient. Mm -hmm. So it's really a blend of the masculine mm -hmm. and feminine qualities that are needed. Mm -hmm. And now we're starting to see not only women, but also men who are feeling more comfortable expressing they some of those qualities, right? Because every... You know, every man has an inner woman, as Carl Jung said, right? Every yes. woman has an inner man. We have the, the mm -hmm. labels get in the way, but the fact is these are all human qualities. But in society, some are suppressed and some are right. And medically also men who have estrogen and uh, testosterone and women have the testosterone. Yeah, we have all. Exactly. So it's yeah. there. And yeah. as you, in fact, as you reach midlife and beyond, right. there's a convergence. Yes. Right? Yes. Women become more assertive, etc. And men actually have more of the emotional right. side. So there's a lot of factors that are leading to that. So the rise of feminine values. And we think not only is it happening, it is also the most essential and necessary thing. Do you have any future plans or any goals that you have to reach still? For me personally now, the next stage of my, my own journey is I'm thinking about a book now that's going to be about healing. Because oh, okay. I think the ultimate purpose in the world today is is to heal. Absolutely. We live in a world of extraordinary suffering, you know, unbelievable mm -hmm. amounts of pain and suffering that people go through every mm -hmm. day. And if we are not part of the healing, we could be part of the hurting. So as individuals and as organizations, we have to consciously think about how are we bringing more joy and alleviating some of the pain and suffering mm -hmm. that people are under. And most of it is inadvertent, mm -hmm. and most of it is self-inflicted or we inflict on each other. Mm -hmm. Right? We cause ourselves True. a great deal of uh, uh, misery, but we also, in, in the context of work, yeah. for example... Yeah. Unhappy and, person will breed unhappiness. Right. And how do we you know, eliminate that and bring more joy? And I think so that's, to me, the ultimate purpose Absolutely. of all organizations is to, is to okay. heal. So now moving on to more personal topics, changing gears. <laughs> so tell us about your uh, family. So Three kids, yes. <laughs> our son Alok and then our girls Priya and Maya. Okay. Okay. So, how did you meet your wife? We met through some common <laughs> friends. She's from Nepal, and I was friends uh, with uh, uh, this couple from Nepal mm -hmm. at Columbia University, and they had gone to high school with her, so they are the ones who introduced us. Okay. And our families had some similarities in background. Oh, okay. Her father also was, he was a diplomat, but he also worked in the agriculture oh, okay. field, the uh, International Fund for Agriculture mm -hmm. Development in Rome. And so we had, we had a number of things in common, so yeah, we met. <laughs> and how long have you been married? 30 years. My goodness, wow. <laughs> <laughs> now that brings me to the last part of the interview, which is called the rapid response. So whatever uh, comes to your mind or you have the shortest answer, uh, let us know. So what is your most favorite hobby? I would say music. music. <laughs> Definitely, yes. Uh, Indian, old Indian songs, basically. Old Indian yes. songs. Old Indian songs. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what's your most favorite book? 
The single most uh, favorite book is Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. When I discovered that book at the age of 50, I bought 200 copies. Mm -hmm. And I gave it to every student, every friend, you know, relatives, everybody. Mm -hmm. And who's your most favorite author apart from him? Uh, P.G. Woodhouse was the greatest uh, influence on me growing <laughs> up, you know, just not only in terms of incredible humor, but also incredible command of the language. Absolutely. I think he was a master at the language. It's my most favorite too. Yeah. Jeeves and Bertie Wooster. And he used to work in a bank and then changed. That's right. And then became an author <laughs> later on, That's right? right? Yeah. Okay. What do you think is your biggest strength? I think my strength is, is, uh, is compassion and, uh, and sensitivity to other people. Okay. What's your uh, yes, yeah. biggest weakness? It could be, you know, the strength can be taken too far, can be weakness. So not being able to say no when sometimes <laughs> you need to say no, I think that, that, is, that is certainly okay. a weakness that I work okay. on. Now, uh, what's your most favorite travel destination? Uh, of the places I've been to recently, I think uh, Barcelona. Of the places I lived, I want to go back to Barbados. Uh -huh. you know, I lived, lived yeah. there as a kid. I'm sure we loved it then. I'm sure it's uh -huh. even better now. It's you know, changed. So. We just came back from Barbados. Oh, really? Oh, wow. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. Now, um, what's your favorite food? The favorite cuisine would be Indian. Okay. Within that, I love a lot of Rajasthani food, but I also love Kashmiri. Uh -huh. Kashmiri okay. Rogan Josh, for example. It's and dal a dish that I make. <laughs> yeah, and dal bati, which is more Rajasthani. Do you make dal bati too? Uh, not very well. I tried to make it, it came out like rocks. You know? <laughs> Because <laughs> being vegetarian, I was eating. <laughs> so, when I first met you 10 years ago, um, I heard you sing a song, which I think is your signature song. You sang it so well. Do you think you could sing a couple of lines for our viewers? <laughs> I think the song you're referring to is Mere Mehboob from the movie of that same name, which is 1967 maybe, mm -hmm. which we saw when we were living in Barbados. Uh -huh. and we actually recorded the whole thing, so it uh -huh. kind of became imprinted in me. It's one of the most romantic songs I've ever written. Sure, absolutely. Like, music by Classic, Nash, Nashad, classic. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll try to sing a line or two. Mere mehboob tujhe Meri mohabat ki kasam Mere mehboob tujhe Meri mohabat ki kasam फिर मुझे नरगिसी आँखों का सहारा दे दे मेरा खोया हुआ रंगीन नजारा दे दे मेरे महबूब तुझे after that, I can't ask any more questions. I mean, so okay, that was embarrassing enough. Thank you so much. It was such a pleasure to interview. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Manjima. I appreciate it.